Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Hello, welcome to another episode of Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. I am your host, Lindsay Pritchard Fox, and today I am joined by Vicki Reynolds, who is the Chief Technology Officer at I3PT and the Global Vice Chair for Women in BIM. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. All right. So there's so much that I want to dig into um, <laughs> because you do play very important roles, both in uh the chief technology role and the women in BIM role. Um, can you give our listeners a little taste on how you found yourself as chief technology officer um, with I3PT? I said that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, before we jump into the women in BIM scenario. Yeah, absolutely. So I've had a really, really bizarre career journey. Um, I've worked in loads of different industries before I found myself in construction. Uh, I worked for a software development company. I worked in facilities management, never quite felt satisfied. And then um, a friend of mine said, look, if you want to solve problems, join construction because there are lots and lots of problems. And so I, uh, I took her advice and I went and I interviewed for a, a role in a construction firm, no experience whatsoever. And they, uh, they asked me to be a document controller. So I started in document control on an 8.2 billion pounds worth um, of, of development project and uh, realized that there was really no consistency, no logic to the way that information and data was being managed and shared. And I got more and more obsessed with the concept and the idea of improvement um, that I just found myself digging deeper and deeper into um, changes that were required and efficiencies that could be made. That then obviously led me towards BIM. Um, I became really, really obsessed with BIM and digital construction. Um, I did a lot of learning and research at home and I threw myself into every conversation that I could um, that I could get into uh, around digital construction technology BIM IT and um, went from project to de delivery to um, BIM implementation and then digital change management um, and it just developed and developed uh, and I found myself then um, working at I3PT just over a year ago now as their head of digital with the idea that I would I'd come in and help them to digitalize further. We also have a software as a service um, platform. So I was, I was due to lead that as well. Within a few months, it really came to light that I was doing more of a chief technology officer role. Um, so I'm responsible for um, the roadmap for the services side of the business for the technology and the digitalization there of our processes, but also the roadmap for the software solutions um, and the management of the software development team, the operations, support, marketing, everything, everything around there. So um, absolute bizarre journey. Never, ever once been in my comfort zone, but I think it turns out that's where I, uh, I operate weirdly most comfortably is when I'm feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the listeners on this can uh, relate to that. And in your, I was reading a bit about um, I3PT and I thought I was very compelled by the mission behind mm -hmm. uh, uh, that your company. Um, does that something that aligns with your personal perspective? And is that something that you're pushing into the construction industry? And can you elaborate a little bit on what that mission is? Absolutely. So the whole mission of I3PT, um, which does stand for independent third party testing, that was the initial thought behind the name. Um, it was developed as a company in response to some new legislation in Ireland at the time, um, which called for a role of an assigned certifier to independently verify um, construction projects, the, the quality and the workmanship, essentially. So um, we found that or our CEO at the time, the, the, the um, owner of the company, 
found that a lot of bigger organizations were bolting on this certification arm to meet the requirements of the legislation, but there was a real conflict of interest because they were also a design house or they were a contractor on the side or a project manager. Um, so the, he, he wanted to create something completely independent with no conflicting interests um, that could really just focus on increasing quality, improving health and safety and making construction better. Um, that then turned into a whole range of inspectors that we have. Some of the, some of the people I work with are terrifyingly intelligent um, and it really puts me in my place day to day. Uh, but they uh, were collecting all of this data and information, trying to force it and shoehorn it into systems that already existed um, in terms of information management workflows, accountability workflows, and they just couldn't find a system that worked the way they wanted. So that is where Cert Central, our software as a service, was developed. It was originally a response to our own needs. So we we are our own customer, which um, if you've ever had an in-house customer, when you're delivering anything, you, you'll know that they are uh, they don't hold back. They are your biggest critic. So it's been really great. Um, but the thing that really attracted to attracted me to I3PT, um, I wasn't looking to change role when I met Owen, our CEO. I was very happy where I was, um, but it was just his enthusiasm for improvement, um, the culture of the organization. Everybody's a leader. It's a very flat structure. Um, we've got over 70 people in the company, um, but they are 70 very talented people, very great retention rate. Um, I think there's maybe at max four to five people that have left in the eight years history of the company. Um, and the culture is essentially, we strive for good quality, um, in fact, the best quality to make buildings safe, to make um, buildings in a way that look after the people around them and that are responsive to the environment around them as well. So it's just a, this real focus on doing the right thing, not just ticking a box or doing what you're expected to do. I do think that it's interesting because I don't know if our um, the general audience in the U.S. is familiar with the global climate of digital um, innovation in construction. And mm -hmm. being that you and your company and the roles you play are very deeply invested in this global um, ecosystem. Can we kind of take a step back and can you got, give us kind of an over, overview of how uh, digitization is moving into the construction industry and some of the things that you're really excited about? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the UK was the, the birthplace really of um, the BIM standards. So our British standards for information management and BIM were then built into the ISO, so ISO 19650, which is the international standard. Um, and so we really have been, we weren't necessarily the founders of the, the concept, but we certainly have been the drivers. Um, there is a very active and very vocal community in the UK pushing digital innovation. Um, we've we've got a lot of lessons learned as well from the implementation of BIM. Um, some are uh, things to do with culture and some are things to do with technology, but essentially um, there's a real embrace of digitalization. We're starting to see um, the incorporation of more things like smart machines and robots. Um, I would, highly recommend Googling um, Spot, the Boston Dynamics robot dog. Um, it's a construction robot, very, very cute, but it, it, very intelligent as well. So it can do things like um, navigate its way around a construction site, climb stairs by itself. Uh, it can, it doesn't need to be um, observed in any way. It can, it can be programmed to carry out a function and it will make intelligent decisions whilst it's whilst it's moving and so for things like strapping a um a laser scanner to his head and taking verification um or capturing sort of verification or progress information every evening for instance on a construction site um it's it's an ideal uh a worker for, for something like that and all of that is bubbling away in the in the uk community um 
I think there are a lot of think tanks as well here. Um, there's a real pride in our digital culture and the, but interestingly, actually, we've now got to a position where that's going to be supported by legislation as well. So we had a mandate in 2016 for um, BIM to be delivered as the, the primary uh, method for project delivery ac across all government construction projects. Um, it, what it actually did is it encouraged people to deliver BIM on the side because it was a it was a mandate. It was a new um, a new type of technology and a new process. People were a bit scared of it. It came in very quickly. So we we developed BIM teams to do to do BIM over there. Um, and there are a lot of we learned a lot from that. Um, and but now in response to a very unfortunate tragedy, actually, um, in uh, a, a couple of years ago, we had a the Grenfell Tower fire. So it was a fire in a residential high rise building, 72 people lost their lives. And the, after investigation, it has been pinpointed that bad information management and unclear accountability and responsibilities for safety and for the materials that were put into that building were directly responsible for those deaths. And so new legislation is coming into the UK uh, summer this year, the building safety bill. and the backbone of that is what we're calling the digital um, digital golden thread of information. So it will legislate good information management and it references the UK BIM framework, um, which is uh, our sort of framework for BIM and digital construction. And it's very reliant on the digital capture, management and sharing of information. I think the sharing of information is so key there. And then the quality of the information. So we, I'm a big proponent of laser scan technology and how it can be used. And it is a little bit difficult for many in uh, the U S culture to feel like there is, there's mandates coming in for this type of methodology. What I'm seeing is that there's enough efficiencies gained that the private sector is electing to do these types of implement implementation strategies. The sad part is that uh, we wouldn't have a, a government standard that's kind of creating this overarching language around how building information modeling or building information management is being delivered. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's having too many different languages in the same, so it's like different vernaculars. Um, mm -hmm which is very similar to the way the U.S. culture works generally is that we used to be called like a melting pot. And then someone said, no, we're more like a salad. <laughs> <laughs> we have, you know, very strong identities within a uh, cultural group. So it is sometimes hard to formulate that, um, that common language, but it is, it, it's extremely important. And I think what's great is having, I was recently on a, a Rochester Builder Exchange presentation and uh, there was um, a tone in the construction industry that if it's not broken, don't fix it. And what's sad to me is that the industry can't recognize that it is broken because they didn't have solutions that could fix it. And I'm really excited to say there are solutions, so maybe now we can acknowledge that there are broken things. And um, the tragedy you spoke of in um, with the, so many people losing their lives in regards to poor building management, I, you know, there's there there are things that are broken, and anybody who's really doubting that should just Google can, engineering fails. And you can just see endless videos of bridges and buildings and endless amounts of things that um, that have failed. And you do see the loss of life. And this, that's the thing. It's sort of, it's funny to watch a compilation on YouTube of like um, half of a building falling down and, you know, these these silly fails that when, when nobody's hurt or nobody's injured, and then all of a sudden someone loses a life or multiple people lose their lives. And we go, oh my God, we never saw this coming. And it's like, really? Did you, did you not see this coming? Because there are... 500,000 views on this YouTube clip of, of funny fails. So we've seen it, you know, we know it happens. Yes, yes. 
Uh, but it is hard to recognize um, a failing if you don't have something queued up to solve well, it. One thing that was really interesting, actually, I, so I worked with uh, the CIOB, which is the Chartered Institute of Building over in the UK last year to do some mass research on industry capability to um, develop and retain digital information. And interestingly, we asked people about their own competencies, the competencies of their organization and their perceived competencies of the industry. Um, and everybody from every section of the industry thought that they were doing it right, but everybody else was doing it wrong. And so that, and that I think summarizes the problem perfectly. Everybody, everybody thinks it's somebody else's problem when actually it's, everybody's problem and, to, and until we individually take responsibility for being better then nothing is going to change I mean we uh, one of the questions was who owns data at each stage of a construction project and we had the same trend everybody was very comfortable when it wasn't their phase of construction to say ah they own the data at this at this stage but for instance during design stage architects didn't say that's us everybody else says that's architects and then the architects were like oh we don't know it's undefined it's hard to say and for operations everyone said it's the client and the clients would be like well it's really quite complicated and it's a very interesting trend that we have as human beings to to want to perceive problems as someone else's because of someone else's behavior not your own yeah well if you yes yeah, so if you're not part of the well and I guess if you're not part of the solution you're part of the problem um but but if you don't know you're part of the problem you can't be part of the solution so that's the first that's the first hurdle <laughs> the first aha uh <-huh. laughs> yeah well I think you're um we uh have aligning views on how uh how fanatical we are about uh this approach to construction and also the benefit of being in an industry that has a lot of issues that um, are ripe for solving and um so you actually created the the digital twin fan club so yeah i'm, I'm one of the sort of founders there's a handful of us um i very early on was a massive skeptic of digital twins but actually i was more of a skeptic of the our approach to them rather than them as a concept so um i got a phone call from a friend of mine who said you know what what do you think about this whole digital twin thing and i said it's uh, it terrifies me because it's not the right time to be talking about this there's so much misinformation out there um i'm reluctant to engage at all in this conversation and he said well that's exactly why we need to club together to to create a think tank that includes people who are very positive and want to push this forward but also people with reservations or with lessons from previous implementation of um, of processes and technology and so we developed the digital twin fan club as a place completely unaffected by private sector and public sector we are a think tank of professionals we host at the moment it's mainly podcasts because um of the nature of I, I don't think you guys have it as bad as us but in the uk we've been in lockdown now for 12 months so we just can't see other human beings so we've been doing a lot of podcasts but we've had um uh people from outside industry come in to talk about their um the the digitalization of of their industries and implementing digital twins we have very silly games like um uh <laughs> uh twin or not twin where you know we we pull up big, because one of the biggest misconceptions is that a digital twin is a bim model with lots of information and it's not it is the um it has to include a two-way feed of information it's a physical and a virtual both of which affect each other and so if you have a building for instance with a heating system and your sensors are identifying when the building is falling under temperature and then informs your heating system to raise the temperature that's part way there if that then is for instance linked to your room booking system 
that says, well, actually, we know that no one's going to be using that floor of the building anyway for the next two days. So don't turn the heating up. We're fine. Um, and it's that kind of intelligent management that goes from physical to virtual and from virtual to physical that makes a digital twin. Um, and so, the, you know, things like that, those kind of misconceptions, we just want to have those conversations in plain language, enthusiastically, in a fun way that, that makes people want to engage. And um, yeah, and I think that's maybe something that we, we lost focus of in the UK in the early days of implementing BIM. It all became very serious very quickly. Um, I've lost noticed, our love. <laughs> I've noticed, I, um, and I thank God for my children because they get to see what I do. And every day they'll, you know, my daughter plays on roadblocks and she, you know, there's Blocksburg where she gets to build homes and then my, you know, sons are in Minecraft and, and then they see what I do and it's this really easy transition. And they're like, oh, you do real Minecraft. Like, oh, mom, can you create my Blocksburg house in, uh, in Revit? <laughs> yeah, let's do that this weekend. And it's, super fun. And it is something that I can drive people to the industry and a broader audience because it is so, it really, um, gestures to like this very young, enthusiastic, uh, voice in most, most of us. And you get into this very serious industry with very serious life, um, life and safety standards that play on, you know, your psyche. And it is difficult to say, wow, we get to take construction with a different mindset now. It's this living, I love that you, I totally agree. It has to be this two-way flow of information, whether you're in the post-construction and the management of a facility or when you're in the process of creating the facility. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges in early adoption that I've noticed is the expectation that information is static. Mm -hmm. that you can create a printed set of construction documents and hand that off and, and expect not to have any flow through of questions, information, strategies on how to best, you know, execute, you know, what's drawn versus what needs to be manifested. Um, it's not static. It will never be, and we can't make it static. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely, that's true. And we need to break our commitment to, um, to, to hard copy, um, but also to things like handover packs of, uh, so, you know, go, going between design and construction, that sort of line in the sand, right? This is where, and I don't know what it's like in America. I think you guys are, are maybe a little bit more like Australia, which is where you you have build only contracts. So your contractor inherits the design and they build it as designed. Right. But in the UK, we have what we call design construction like contracts where you um, you inherit a partial design. And the responsibility is on the contractor then to take that into specialist design. Um, and because we're obsessed with, well, where's the handover point? Like, where's the, who's contractually responsible up until exactly which point? And how do we document that with a, with a physical handover of documents? Um, it, it then really muddies the water. Actually, there are ways to track responsibility and accountability in a much more fluid way at a at a an element by element basis in a model um, that is clearer to understand and easier to manage than it is in a, a set of 2D drawings or a, um, a floor plan or something like that that has multiple elements and multiple work packages in it that like the water is so muddy there you could it's hard to focus on what you need to focus on and where the responsibilities are. And uh, I mean, yeah, and, and it's a lot to digest. It's not something that is one of the reasons I founded my company is because I've watched people in the industry. Fortunately, my relationship with um, women in BIM and getting to see a little taste of, of 
the complex implementation of digital twin and um, all the, these great concepts globally, it's, it's intimidating, it's exhausting, it's confusing. Uh, we, I was on the UK panel um, as a regional lead for women in BIM and uh, one of our panelists had said, who's responsible for like, for the digital twin reality? You know, it, it, it isn't something that you can just put a crown on someone's head and put, you're it. Uh, so to, to have all of that be digested and, and just taking a look at construction in a new and different way, um, yeah, it can, be, it can be intimidating and exhausting. And I think we froze for a bit. Hold on one, oh, oh yep, we froze. Yeah, sorry, my I lost a little bit of my connection oh. there for a second. So I just turned my camera off to to reconnect it. Um, how ironic when we're talking about, you know, <laughs> technology and, and digital and how great it is that it suddenly fails on me like that. Um, <laughs> so I got the majority of what you were saying. Um, but I just missed the end bit there. If you could just repeat that for me, sorry. Oh, we were, I was just saying how intimidating and exhausting it is. And, and then wanted to like blend into, you know, finding uh, women in BIM. Uh, we spoke a little bit about, you know, our, my entry into women in BIM and your position and, you know, being part of that group, did it, did it help find like common voice for you to, you know, drive you forward a little bit? Yeah, it actually, um, it did two things at once for me when I first joined the group. Um, it, it gave me comfort because I realized all of a sudden I wasn't the only one struggling like in the, with all the concepts and everything that I felt like I needed to understand because the, the problem is we take on a role um, as, as BIM, like the all knowing, all seeing BIM person on a project um, or in the UK, it can sometimes be digital. So you end up like anything, you become IT support on your projects as well. Um, and you come and you become responsible not only for intricate technical delivery and competence there, but you'll be the person that's expected to um, organize strategy and to implement and to rally the troops and communicate. And that's a, that's a lot of knowledge for one person to hold on their own. And I, for, for a long time, I thought, my God, am I the only person struggling with this? Because everyone else looks so confident. And then I joined Women in BIM and I went to some um, uh, uh, like group sessions where we were just socializing really at the end and talking to people. And I thought, oh my God, it's not just me. Everyone's going through this. And actually this woman here has this specialism and I have my specialism. And I know now that I can call her for advice on that and she can call me on advice for this. So connecting those technical specialists was, oh, it was a real godsend for me in the early days to have someone that I trusted that wouldn't judge me for not knowing. Um, that was the big thing. Um, but then also what the group did for me was open up my eyes to a wider global environment. And there's an element of competition there, you know, you look and you see what other people are doing in other countries and you go, oh, well, I want to be doing that. Um, and there's also just an absolute mass of lessons learned as well. So um, some of the panels that we did last year were specifically around BIM around the world. And we had panelists from different countries all talking about their experiences over the past two to three years. Um, and you realize, yeah, there are similarities, but also, ah, that country did this and we haven't got to that point yet. So I should be mindful that maybe that's our next step. Maybe I need to prepare for this. Um, so it was really great on both, for both um, sort of angles there. Well, that, that is where Rebecca and I, did she go, the founder of Women in, we connected. Um, I saw all this incredible stuff happening globally. And I was seeing it done in really complex delivery systems. Um, you know, it's not, it's not easy to uh, inspire change individually, but it's even harder when you're inspiring change bureaucratically. So we're not dealing with whether a construction person wants to take this approach 
to design coordination, we're dealing with an entity with like, you know, hundreds of people saying that we have, we've all got to get on this track and kind of run the train this direction and then align each of those trains with uh, the parallel deliveries <laughs> for each. So building my company was let's just do it for a house. Yep. <laughs> let's, let's just take this back to the beginning. Now that we mm-hmm. have all of these really complex systems in place and, and softwares and all of these strategies and processes, let's use it on a house. And so we totally geeked out to that and how it could impact um, sustainability and uh, waste reduction and you know safety of a home yeah. and having the systems be installed correctly. <laughs> Not fall yeah. down. Um, yeah. And that's that's so important though, the, these passion projects. And actually that's something that um so in in my last role I worked for a, a major contractor in the UK and um it was we were in that point where we were moving towards what we called model first delivery. So every project that we delivered was going to be delivered with the model at the center of information management. So all decisions, everything, cost, all of that would happen with model data rather than drawings. Um, But to move towards that, we really had to pick something that showed very clear value to bring everybody else along in that journey. And I was um, at a a meeting with women in BIM and I was brainstorming with um, uh, another woman that I'd met and we got onto the subject of actually start very small, like pick something tiny that you can really objectively show that improvement of value. And when I went back into the office um, a couple of weeks later, one of my other colleagues had been having a similar conversation and we sort of brainstormed together and he was like, we should do a virtual mock-up of one small area. So one small area of high repeatability in a, in a high rise. Um, and we, we chose an area that had sort of a, a pod um, and that was repeated. I think it ended up being repeated about 25 to 30 times up, up the building. And we modeled it to just absolute intricate detail. And we found some issues um, that never would have been picked up until uh, we were building on site. And we were then able to say, right, with X amount of extra effort, we got X amount of additional value. So we were able to put costs against the issues that we found at that stage and say, all right, if we then didn't identify them until we were on site, this is the cost and efficiencies implications of that. Um, And that then formed the basis of our case that we were able to put to the rest of the organization. Um, And we found that people from other projects were then coming in and saying, right, we, we want to do the same thing on our project, which is take a very small area to focus on. Um, so we're not overwhelming people by saying every element of BIM on this project has to be intricate, intricate detail, but pick a point where it matters. Because then you get to do the passion bit as well, because it's so much fun modeling up to that detail and doing that kind of analysis and driving the um, the visualizations. You know, everybody loves a sexy, sleek visualization. Um, and uh, we ended up, that ended up being the, the standard method on every single project that we did from then on. We would identify at the beginning of the project um, which area we would be creating a mock-up for. And... Um, yeah, that all came from really just this conversation with somebody else in Women in BIM brainstorming, thinking, how do we show the value? Um, yeah, to, and yeah, taking that little, taking that microscope down to, you know, that part of the structure that, and then perhaps that part of the structure is replicated, you know, a unit is replicated throughout a building and then you can extrapolate all of the benefits there. Absolutely, because with the new legislation in the in the UK as well for um, for building safety and fire safety, the focus of that is structural and fire information only, because the idea is that if we try and completely change the requirements for all project information in the next two years, 
it's too much to handle and we're not going to learn any lessons there aren't increment there aren't incremental learnings that can happen it's you know all in all out we fail or we win but right. if we focus on the two areas of highest risk which we've identified time and time again a, a fire safety components and and structure um then if we can come up with very good processes for information management and what we're calling this this golden thread of information from concept all the way through to demolition of a building um that can then be replicated or or made bigger to incorporate other parts of a building um, and i think that's one of the biggest problems is we feel like it's all or nothing we're digitizing so we have to digitize it all right now <laughs> Yes. I, yes, I absolutely agree. And it is something that, uh, I need to deal with on a case by case basis. Uh, even in my presentation most re recently demonstrating that when we do an export of our quantity schedules, that I can export them to Excel. And in mm -hmm. my world, if you're not, you know, if a contractor is not paper on, you know, pen on paper, Excel is the next, you know, step. So it's a very comfortable, um, export and wanting to say, it's okay, we can run parallel systems, um, analog, digital, and it, that redundancy right now is actually needed mm -hmm. so that you can gain that uh, enthusiasm for the process and then confidence in the process. Yeah. I mean, the biggest focus for us at I3PT with our software um, I would say, God, almost like 70% of our focus has been on um, the usability and the user experience for our app. So we have a web solution, which tends to be used by the more capable. So, you know, management or those who have to analyze and create reports anyway, day to day. So they're used to, you know, Excel or maybe things like Costex or some other, um, some other applications. But the guys on site and the girls on site who are um, doing quality inspections or raising issues, normally what they would have done before is take loads of pictures on a digital camera or on their phone, go back to the office, write a, a report on each one, upload it, put it into a Word document and send it off. Um, our app allows them to take the pictures, add the comments, mark everything up. Um, press send and then it instantly disseminates that into a series of workflows the right people see the based on work packages um, if you raise an issue with a work package we know who's responsible for that work package so then that issue gets sent to them and it remains open until they close it out and then it's fed back to the original person who raised it who can review it make sure they're happy and it gets closed off but all of this is reliant on the person initially being comfortable using that app if that doesn't work the whole process falls down. And so, so much of our focus was, where do we put this button? What color is it? How is this? Like um, our, our um, digital design manager, our UX manager really has a great saying, which is um, uh, recognition over recall. So with digital tools, if people just intuitively recognize the way things should work, so we mimicked a lot of things that people use all the time, like Facebook and um, an Outlook and all those things that they use every day. We put buttons in the same place that did the same thing. So it was a mimic um, rather than recall, which is having to remember yourself through experience. That ways, you know, yeah. I push this, then this, then this. Yes, I took exactly. So it's if it's intuitive, it's like, oh, wait, that big that big green button there that pops up in the middle when it, it assumes I've finished my report is probably what I need to press, like things like that. And it's the same with implementing new technology on, um, on, a, on site. It's like you have to identify your most important stakeholder and you can guarantee that it is never the person who knows the most about the technology. And so you have to bring it to them, to bring it to the lowest common denominator. And, and sometimes that means only showing them exactly what they need to know and what's relevant to them. They don't care about anything else. And actually you don't care about anything else because as long as they do that, then that's the catalyst for everything else to happen properly. Yeah. And particularly decisions. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
who needs to decide. And if I give you 10 decisions to make versus one, yeah, um, I'm going to get that one decision right now <laughs> versus batching them and saying, oh, we've got to do, you know, half a dozen of these things all at once. It's just, it's just hard. It's, it's acknowledging that humans are imperfect and trying to create systems around, uh, you know, those imperfections or, you know, those, the diversity reality, you know, I've read some really interesting books. There's uh, Kat Holmes uh, wrote a book about um, equity and inclusion and how the systems of our world have tried to normalize. But what ends up happening is that normalization actually excludes. Because if when you're trying to cater to everyone, you end up catering to no one. Yeah. So being able to identify your audience and who needs to be accessing, making decisions and um, sharing uh, mm -hmm. is a real, it's, it's, it's brilliant that that's now finally pushing into the construction industry. Absolutely. And it's the difference as well between digitization and digitalization. So digitization is taking a process that already exists and making it digital. Digitalization is taking a process, reviewing it, reinventing the process so that it's not only digital, but it's also completely like much more efficient. Um, and so an example of that would be, um, oh, I, do, I don't know, just, uh, my brain's gone completely. Oh, oh, so I guess it would be the difference between um, uh, letter writing and then instant messaging. You know, like you can, from letter writing to email is sort of digitization. Yes. But then all of the, it, in fact, all of the background smart technology that then haps, happens in Outlook is digitalization. Um, so, you know, where it can then import into calendars and I don't know if, if it happens to you, but my outlook now prompts me to, um, to be better. It's like, you promised to do this the other day and it sends me prompts and, um, and that kind of thing is then, you know, starting to change the process and the behavior to be better rather than just mimicking analog in a digital way. There are, there are far better examples, but I can't think of any right now off the top. That's of my head. enough. I mean, I, I mean, I totally get it, and that is, that is. I mean, I think that is that's hard, and I think that having that mentality is uh, going to be driven by a di more diverse audience uh, moving into certain industries, and I think that's where we've connected through women in BIM. Is how do we? I will say over and over again, I will have won. If someone says I I'm a bimmer or they're a bimmer and there's not a default gender or identity connected with that role, you know I say nurse and there is an inherent upbringing in my Greg I call it visibility graphics because when I use Revit there's all these visibility graphics filters and I'm like all right so these are visibility graphics that have I've been raised with. When I say nurse, it's a, it's a female. When I say doctor, it's a male. When I say, and so if I say I'm, I'm a bimmer, mm -hmm. if the next generation has no idea who's, who's behind the building information model or that type of identity. But the only way we do that is if we have some groups and I, you and I spoke about this, you had a great article on uh, BIM plus uh, it's called dot co.uk, but it was this Q&A about um, how Women in BIM uh, has founded some of the missions behind it. Um, it's a great article and how the purpose of it. And so if you could just elaborate a little bit, and I can just go on, but I'm going to let you take it over now. <laughs> no, no. So um, Women in BIM has some core sort of drivers and the first one is to attract women into BIM and digital construction. And then it's to retain, and then it's to promote. But all of this is so that the industry becomes more diverse. 
I mean, if you want to take gender out of it, actually, it's about eliminating groupthink. It's about making the industry more sustainable. We need different types of people to exist so that we make decisions that are representative of the population because we're building buildings for people. We're not building buildings for men. And um, so the, the idea is that we want to make the industry as accessible as possible, but not only for women to join it, but for women to be um, fully immersed. So exactly what you say, it's not a surprise when you walk into a room and you're like, oh, you've been managed as a woman. Um, it's just, you. there's no, you know, there's no question. Over it. Yeah, preconceived, for, yeah. And a lot of what we, a lot of what we try and do in the, in the background as well. So there's a lot of industry facing stuff, um, which is around getting more um, female representation on panels. Um, and A, that's to help promote the, the amazing women that we know of with some incredible knowledge that they, that they should be sharing. Um, but it's also to provide those the visible role models as well, because when I go into schools and colleges and I talk about my job, pe people are always surprised. Kids are always surprised. And the first thing I, I always remember the first school like talk I did, which was probably about six or seven years ago. Now I walked in and um, the first question that I got asked when I'd finished my whole presentation about how amazing BIM is and digital construction and construction is a great career. A boy put his hand up. I was like, yeah, what's your question? And he went, you don't look like a builder miss. And that was, that was, that's all he'd taken from my presentation. Like the whole time I was talking, he was just thinking something doesn't look right here. You know, something doesn't compute. And that is a massive, massive issue. Um, because I mean, I don't, I don't know about America, but we have a huge skill shortage in construction as well. And We're unless there. we, yep. we have like 50% of the population that we are just not attractive to as an industry. Um, and we need to be so that we can fill that skills gap. So, um, yeah, I guess to answer your question, we are trying to, um, create an environment where we become the norm because another thing that that happens very often um, is people will ring me up or they'll email women in BIM and they'll say, we need a woman for a panel. And the important information that they think they need to give me is the date and the time. They don't think for a second that they need to specify competency, technical understanding, like they're not looking for a specialist. They're just looking for a pair of boobs because then it's representative and they've ticked their diversity box. And that shows that there is still a long way for us to go. It's that, you know, there's still this understanding that you can be a token woman on a panel. So that is a real, real driver of what we're doing as women in BIM. We pair with a lot of um, in, uh, industry events globally, actually. Um, we have what we call a media partnership um, where we help the event to organize their panels and to feed um, female professionals into speaking slots, panels, other environments where they can share their knowledge and, and prove their sort of competency um, so that it becomes just more and more like, like just ingrained. People start to recognize women in this environment and that they are just, they do this job and they do it well. Yes. And I, in, when I was reading this interview in this Q and a, uh, at what, one of them is like, what's the biggest challenge. And I loved your answer. Cause it was finding the time to do all the things that I need to do mm -hmm. and having to take the time to do this interview with me or, and that interview, um, that is something that does fall on the underrepresented group. So not only are you trying to move through an industry that already has roadblocks for you for so many reasons, um, you then also need to allocate time to bring awareness and you have to be comfortable on these 
panels and comfortable with public speaking, that's a universal reality is that people most are not comfortable in a public speaking scenario. So Mm -hmm. finding the time, but also over being forced to overcome, um, you know, fears and just, you know, comfort levels to, to take that. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be, I need, I need to get my work done. (laughs) And if I'm going to be into leadership positions. That's absolutely, you've hit the nail on the head and there is so much pressure. So there's no room to be average for, for women. A lot of the time we have to be exceptional, um, which is just adds extra pressure. Um, because we stand out. That's the thing. If you're, and this, this happens a lot where uh, I, I will be the only woman on a panel of six and the other five are all white men in their fifties, probably all wearing glasses, you know? And um, so if one of them says something stupid or that is misinterpreted, it's one of those guys said something, I can't remember which one. Whereas if I say something stupid or that can be misinterpreted, it's that woman, what was her name? That's it. And I will be remembered. I'm more like to be remembered. Right off. She doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> That's it. It's like the basically the stakes are higher because you can you're you're much more memorable. You're one of few rather than one of many. And I um it's also there can be a frustration as well with some people who are organizing these events or if you're in an organization where they have quotas god forbid and um you know that someone's a diversity hire you are eagle-eyed watching them because you didn't want to hire them anyway and there's someone else probably who you think was better for that job and so you're just waiting for them to mess up just you know the woman who was only hired because she was a woman um and so there's there's just all of this extra pressure there's so much out there's so much more going on yeah to think you're, under, about. you're under a micro um a microscope and i do think it's interesting yeah. so when you're having that uh discussion about women in the construction industry there is an inherent desire to fly under the radar because you already are under a microscope and the sad part there is that you're place in the room or your place in the table uh, will not potentially have the impact that you could have because you're, there's fear that you're going to raise your voice and you're going to ruffle feathers, but you're there to instigate something um, and to, to kind of create, create a group, a women in BIM group where you can have a nice conversation with like-minded professionals that can say, bolster you Mm -hmm. when you're going into a room. Yes. Use your voice. Yep. You're right. And I've used Mm -hmm. my mentor through, uh, the women in BIM scheme to test some of these big ideas I had, uh, to say, if I said this really loud, because I have the benefit of a podcast or I have a benefit of being able to have a website where I can drop, you know, blog posts, I'm going to say this. What are your thoughts? <laughs> kind of get the pat on the back. Yep, that needs to be said. Say that, please. Yep. <laughs> yep. The the mentor scheme has it's been incredible to watch. So I um I'm really really fortunate actually. We had a uh, a pairing where the mentor dropped out, and so I stepped into the mentor position. And my mentee actually has been so incredible for me um just we've we've built to this sort of relationship where we help each other out and i do exactly what you just said there to her as well and she gives me feedback um but the speaking to the matches that we've had the response has been just overwhelmingly positive that to have that safe person that person that you become comfortable with and you you get that report and you can turn around and say, is this, if you had this experience before, is this the right thing to do? What do you think? Without there being ramifications of that person working for your own organization 
or someone that you might have to work with in the future. You know, in, in some of these instances, the mentor mentee matches are in different continents even. So, you know, as long as, um, as, as long as there's similarities in the development of the, the countries that they're in and the time zones match up, we're not too committed to making sure that people are, are right next to each other. I mean, this day and age, everything happens virtually anyway. So that means you've got that extra level of security too, because you can say, you know, I'm never going to work with you, <laughs> but I can, <laughs> so I can say really silly stuff to you and, and you can be my acid test, you know? So, um, yeah, is, the feedback we've really has been amazing. And the fact that women in BIM has done all of this at no cost, like there's not a fee to be a member. There's not a fee to sign up. Yeah. And a huge thanks to all the sponsors who are empowering that because it is, it is groundbreaking. Um, and we are, I mean, yeah. I am running up against a, uh, the, a time slot. So I do need to sign off soon, but I want I just wanted to say that you and I discussed about like the women in group versus a diversity in group. And you had a really great insight because I was a little disinclined to get into a women in group and further exclusion because it's a gender based group. Can you just say, say what you said before? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's not about grouping all the women in together. It's about creating that, that, environment that supports and lifts women and such a huge part of what we do as well is um our allies so we are not a group of women for women we are uh, we have our membership which is female only but we also have ally membership and those it you can be it can be male female um you know anyone really who wants to know how you can help support the drive to to make construction more inclusive um so and and our allies really are phenomenal um in in the work and the support that they give that they give us um yeah it's uh we're we're very very lucky but i mean we we also have the stance that we work closely with other groups so i i keep a close eye on, you know, there's, there's Black People in Construction, which is a UK based group as well, BPIC. Um, and we work really closely with them to make sure that we're aligned with, with our messaging and what we're doing. And it really is not about just celebrating us. It's about celebrating everybody by bringing everybody up together. Um, so that's, it, it's not about excluding anyone. And one of the, I really enjoyed hearing that before we can really drive uh, diversity, we have to identify the barriers and the pain points that a particular group faces mm -hmm. and to have a cohesion and to have a platform where you can kind of, kind of uh, distill down, like, what are the top things that we need to overcome right now? Cause yeah, we, we know we got a lot. But mm -hmm. for the for women to find a foothold, you know, what what are those particular things that we need to solve? And then, you know, you can branch that into each um, e each diversity group that you want and say, like, all right, well, what does your group need to really feel comfortable in this scenario? And what if the things that are our pain points overlap enough so that, you know, we're, there's cohesion here. We've starting to establish solutions to these problems. Is that benefiting your group as well? And having those partnerships within an industry is phenomenal. It's new. It's, um, I mean, also women aren't all the same too. You know, with their women, with, there are women of color. There are, are women in the LGBTQ community, different socioeconomic circumstances. And so I cannot know from my position what is the best course of action for a woman who's on the other side of racism, for instance. Um, and there are needs there that, um, you know, we can't just throw all under one banner. And so the group is and, and has a need to be um, as open and as understanding and as exploratory as we can be, because there's always crossover 
um, with every other element of, of a person's life. So we are just one aspect, you know, we're one aspect of a, of a woman, but every woman ha has many, many different areas that may or may not cause um, her to have benefits or, um, or to hold her back. Well, you've been a great voice and I really respect that you took the time to come on. If you have, uh, if anybody wants to reach out, there's womeninbim.org, right? Mm -hmm. Said that right? And then if you, uh, if anyone wants to reach out with, uh, to you in LinkedIn, how do they do that? Well, um, I'm, I'm just Vicky Reynolds on LinkedIn, V-I-C-K-I-R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S. Um, I'm also on Twitter, Vicky underscore digital. Um, women in BIM are very active on Twitter as well, at Women in BIM. Um, and on LinkedIn, we have a company page, which you can follow. And we also have a closed Women in BIM group as well that you can um, uh, apply to be a part of. So there's loads of different ways to connect. Um, so please do. <laughs> That's incredible. And Inside the Firm is now on YouTube. So subscribe for your chance to win some firm merch. And if you could leave five-star review, because that really helps us uh, reach a broader audience. And if you're looking for more information um, about Inside the Firm content, you can follow Inside the Firm on LinkedIn at Inside the Firm or on Instagram at ITF Podcast. Um, and Vicki, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm sure we'll you know, be speaking again soon. Thank you so much for having me on.